Attitude! We are going to energize the country. Stop Brexit! No more Mr. Nice Guy. Another future is possible, but we've got to fight for it. Order! Hello and welcome to the debated podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will. And in this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by a returning guest. Uh, it's Sajit Bakshi, who is the head of political markets at Smarkets. Welcome back to the podcast. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so the first question uh, that I'd like to ask is, we've recently seen the result of the Labour leadership contest. Um, Keir Starmer has been elected leader of the Labour Party, Angela Rayner, deputy leader of the Labour Party. And um, Smarkets and the, uh, a lot of the uh, other uh, betting organisations got this result completely spot on and for uh, quite a while before the result was announced. Why do you think that um, you were able to be so precise about the result? Well, it's really down to the customers and um, the traders on Smarkets. Um, what it appears to be that uh, Keir Starmer was such a strong candidate he really was seen by everyone as the one, only one who could really kind of, you know, take the party on from Jeremy Corbyn and move it forward. Um, and then the other candidates didn't make a big enough impact. I think that was the big issue. We were looking for those kind of standout statements from the other, the other candidates, and they did initially. But with recent changes, coronavirus problems, and the Labour leadership thing, process just going on so long, um, they kind of had to step back a bit and without being able to be in the front, giving out their messages, um, it became more of a self-fulfilling prophecy that only Keir could win this. Mm. Um, um, one of the other predictions uh, that you had recently uh, was relating to who would be the uh, new shadow chancellor. And you had um, Rachel Reeves on 39%, she was the favourite, and Annalise Dodds on 25%, and Annalise Dodds has now become uh, the shadow chancellor. Um why do you think that um, regarding who he would pick as his shadow chancellor, there was a bit more doubt in, in terms of the markets? I think like the the other outstanding candidates who he was probably going to pick were all labelled for uh, respective roles in advance. I mean, they were they were known to be um, people he'd probably draw on for other talents. The role of shadow chancellor is a really tricky one because you've got Rishi Sunak, who's this rising star in the Conservative Party, really coming out of nowhere almost in the last few months, um, who's now currently like number two on our next um, prime minister market, um, just behind uh, Keir Starmer, who, you know, is doing well. And he's a chancellor who has money to give away. Uh, there is nothing more popular than a chancellor who's spending money. So this has kind of catapulted him into fame. He's young. Um, he's an attractive man. So you're going to have to have someone who can equally command the airwaves and give respect and, you know, really face up to him. So it, had, it was a tough job and a tough position to take. Rachel Reeves, an economist, very smart person, could easily do that. Uh, and Lee Dodds, also um, very smart, um, got experience at the European level. Um, it had to be some kind of uh, intellectual heavyweight. And I think... There is a number of um, successful, strong candidates in the Labour Party who it could be. So it wasn't as clear cut as the position for leader. I mean, the le leader position is a figurehead, someone who's going to be on TV, who needs to be telegenic. And, you know, Keir really does stand out in that respect, especially with the Bridget Jones kind of overtones of the story. Um, for the other one, it's going to be an intellectual heavyweight. And there are a number that, that could have got it. Um, now, you mentioned um, the potential of um, who would be the next prime minister, uh, either Starmer or the um, current chancellor of the Exchequer, Richard Sunak. Uh, now, one thing that I found quite interesting is that um, you have uh, up, uh, Boris Johnson on 14% uh, to leave as prime minister this year. Um, what's the uh, what, what's the reasoning behind that? Well, I, I don't know if there's a kind of lag in the um, in the market or what people see, but you know, Boris Johnson has recently won an election. And normally, prime ministers do last a while, and he's got a big majority. So, in terms of like normal politics as usual, he shouldn't really be going anywhere. Uh, he's you know very popular amongst the people, you know, the Conservative Party at large. He he has enough to uh, of a majority, as I said, to get through any legislation he wants. Um, I think the doubt, the 14% saying that he would leave this year, 
can be matters outside his control. I mean, I think we've got coronavirus really impacting every area of the economy and making any legislation or any kind of practical policies really difficult and have to be considered in that light. With that in mind, you know, our Brexit markets pretty, have moved pretty considerably. And what we've seen now is that the chance of us leaving with a no deal Brexit sitting at something like um, 90%, uh, 98% that we won't have a no deal Brexit, that we will extend the transition period beyond 2020. And remembering that his, can, his whole cabinet is full of Brexiteers, will they tolerate this? And will they hold him responsible? Now, charitably, I'd say, you know, they, this is completely out of his control, so they, they shouldn't hold him totally responsible. On the other hand, if he doesn't make the Brexit that they want, um, you know, he might be pushed out. Um, now, uh, you mentioned uh, Brexit there and the uh, potential of the transition to be extended longer than uh, the Prime Minister and uh, the government have initially stated. Do you think that this is something that will then, if this occurs, affect the way that the government is perceived in polling? Because at the moment, the Conservatives are doing remarkably well uh, in the polls. Or do you think that... Um, as you mentioned, people perhaps may be a bit more charitable towards uh, the government because of the whole uh, situation with the coronavirus. I think the public at large, uh, you know, are, you know, really reacting very well to these kind of extraordinary measures and are, you know, pulling out the fabric of society in a way to to give him the space to be excused. I think like let's look six or seven months down the line, you know, near November, December, hopefully all of this will be past life. We'll be back to normal, more or less. Um, at that point, um, you know, there would be space for other voices to be heard to be less charitable. So I think it's, it's a kind of waiting game. And I think it's something worth watching in the towards the end of the year, especially if things hopefully pass soon. Um, he will then have to either pull out all stops and come up with something very new, very innovative, that satisfies everyone and gets the deals with the EU and the US and doesn't need to extend the transition period, or more likely that he just won't have time. Uh, and then, uh, and then you know, when these things have passed and things are back to normal, then uh, he has to watch his back, I think. Um, you mentioned uh, there the uh, potential of how he, uh, the Prime Minister, may react once this situation is over. And of course, um, he will be facing uh, an opponent in Keir Starmer who is seen as quite different uh, from his uh, previous opponent, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, as leader of the opposition. How much do you think um, Keir Starmer's shadow cabinet, which he's been uh, announcing in the, the past couple of days, which sees a return of people uh, like David Lammy and Ed Miliband uh, to the shadow cabinet, how much do you think that is going to influence uh, the way that people perceive uh, the opposition to the government? Well, they're, they're obviously um, more kind of what the public perceive as moderate figures than the ones that uh, term Jeremy Corbyn had in his cabinet. Uh, less radical, more experienced, more new Labour um, kind of esque um, in terms of how they're they're seen by others. Uh, I think that will go a long way in terms of placating some people and making sure that they can understand that you know the basically taking a reading from the wind to see that this is the way that Labour's going now. Uh, I think it's important. I think it's it's a shame somewhat that some of the kind of other voices that gave the diversity are, are kind of going, going to be missing from this cabinet, the shadow cabinet. But on the other hand, this may be what they need to become more electable, really, and may be what they need to kind of win back a lot of people they've lost in the last election. Do you think that, um, and then you talked about uh, figures that are more... Um moderate and perhaps this may be how the Labour Party ensures that it's more electable. There are also of course people uh, like uh, Rebecca Long-Bailey who is now a shadow education secretary who are remaining within the shadow cabinet. Do you think that um, this perhaps more open uh, large tent approach having people who were part of the previous shadow cabinet and also people of the more moderate wing will make the Labour Party more of a, a a strong electoral force at the next election? Yeah, I think that there's definitely people who left the Labour Party or could not vote for the Labour Party, as is who had previously voted for the Labour Party. And for them, the broad church kind of approach, I think, is absolutely correct. I think in terms of the media, I think that some of the candidates in the previous 
shadow cabinet were extremely unfairly targeted and there was a very um, unfortunate kind of approach that some of the press took to certain people in the cabinet that I think was pretty borderline disgraceful. Um, this kind of the, these um, this that shadow cabinet I think are kind of more open and more um, media friendly and therefore there won't be that kind of uh, targeting as there has been previously. Um, now, uh, a bit earlier, you mentioned how uh, the prime minister might be uh, dealing with the United States and with a potential trade deal with the United States after Brexit. Now, of course, uh, in the US, we're seeing uh, we're seeing the uh, run up to the US presidential election. And when we um, last spoke, there were a lot more uh, candidates in the race uh, to be the Democratic nominee. Now, it seems as if Joe Biden is pretty much certain to be the Democrats' nominee at uh, the presidential election in November. Why do you think that uh, Joe Biden has become the uh, front runner in the uh, US Democratic presidential race? I think, so Joe Biden really kind of is again a question of what the Democrats can do to, to win right across America. Joe Biden wasn't the most radical candidate. Um, he was probably amongst the more conservative candidates, but, you know, he could shift some of his position um, to appeal to um, the other the other candidates who pulled out voters. Um, it's, it's kind of a thing where the Democrats really, really need to win this election. Um, they need to play Trump kind of as his own game. And I noticed the belligerent tone of, of Biden was really something stand out. I mean, you know, Biden has promised, you know, said like if they were at high school together, he would punch, um, he'd punch Trump, you know, behind the bike sheds or whatever the equivalent is in the US. Um, and he kind of mirrors the violent language that Trump sometimes uh, employs um, about, you know, his political opponents. And I think that this kind of thing does appeal to a certain demographic and it is a demographic that probably has shifted to Trump. Uh, I think that being a candidate who can be a Democrat and employ that and play Trump in his own game has really done Biden a lot of favours. Uh, and I'd probably say that that, in my view, um, is why um, he's done so well. Do you think that um, the fact that Biden is seen as a more conservative figure is why um, Bernie Sanders, who in the earlier stages of the contest seemed to be doing very well, hasn't quite been able to capture uh, the nomination? I think Sanders has his own problems, which are separate from the other candidates. Uh, you know, Sanders has not really done um, as well with uh, black voters in the U.S. He comes from the comes from Vermont. Um, he hasn't really established credibility outside of the Northeast and uh, you know and California, really, which are well, significant states. Uh, but on the you know, can he win the Midwest? Can he win um, the South? I think these are kind of really valid questions and, and Biden brings with him the ability to, to bring those areas with him. And he's not so obnoxious that the Northeast and California can't vote for him. I, I think he has that appeal. He's got these credentials, these kind of progressive credentials under Obama, uh, which he can draw on. Whereas I don't know where Biden, um, where Sanders can reach to get the kind of the black vote that he's you know been unable to win over and, and the other votes that just have, have eluded him to date. Um, now, when we last spoke, um, your uh, predictions, market predictions, uh, were very much firmly on uh, the re-election uh, of Donald Trump. Is that still the case now? So kind of as I'd expect, really, as the candidates have dropped away and it's just been about uh, Biden versus Trump, the market is more or less shifted 50-50. It's like 40 40 something percent, 43, 4 percent to uh, Trump and 40 percent for Biden. So there's, there is a gap between them. Trump is still in the lead, but it's much closer than ever before. Um, one versus one, especially these candidates, it looks like, it, you know, it's a more interesting contest than than it first was. Uh, Trump kind of knows this. I think Trump, you know, and what was came out about Ukraine and what he wanted uh, the Ukrainians to do signifies that he regards Biden as an as a able uh, competitor. So I think it's a very exciting election and we've had enormous amount of money traded on this. I think this is easily going to become like the biggest traded year for politics uh, Smarkus has ever seen. Um, do you think uh, that 
part of the reason that there has been this shift has been the way uh, President Trump has reacted to the coronavirus, because there's been quite a bit of criticism in some uh, areas as to how he has handled it and the way that he has uh, utilised uh, expert advice and, and, and medical advice. Coronavirus is one of these, is basically like a war, um, a really serious war where the whole country um, reacts in a way that the, 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 the whole country will be affected by the decisions of politicians and there are no good decisions to be made. I mean, I think that's the issue here. There's not a crowd pleasing, easy decision that, you know, has some minor consequences for certain bits of the electorate. Whatever happens, you know, they, there's either the economy is badly affected or there's going to be lots of deaths. Um, Trump, first of all, you know, there's that old expression, you don't change horses in midstream. Uh, I think that applies here. Trump is, you know, in a way, this is his war, his war president. Uh, it would enable him to kind of talk about the positive things that are happening and how the U.S. is all coming together, which is great. Um, on the other hand, you know, he he if he presides over an economy that is tanking, he knows he's going to lose votes. He's going to lose votes hugely. You know, I, he made a valid point saying the U.S. is not built to be shut down. It, it's completely correct. If he shuts it down, if he does what is needed in terms of quarantining to protect life, the economy will suffer and he will carry the can. Uh, if he lets the economy go on, then people will, will unfortunately die. It's, it's a terrible position that any um, leader finds themselves in. And it will directly affect his chance of being elected, no matter which way. Uh, what do you think will be um, the way that if Joe Biden is elected president, he will deal with Brexit? So I, I think that there's a kind of always present issue in the US, which is that um, the Irish question for Americans is much more important than we realise. A lot of um, Irish Americans are influential. Um, and have a lot of sway in, especially um, with the Democratic Party, um, and will be taken into account. Um, we need to have a good settlement with Ireland as part of um, the end of the transition period for Brexit. Um, and if we can do that, then I think that the US will be minded to give us a, a trade deal. Whether it will be better than the deal they've given the EU uh, is a completely different matter. But I, I think they'd be mind to give us a great trade deal, a good, a good enough trade deal uh, to make it to satisfy what we need. Um, if we don't resolve the Irish question adequately, then I think it's a different matter, and especially for a democratic um, president uh, to deal with. Do you think that um, if uh, uh, the Conservative uh, Party in Britain were dealing with a democratic administration uh, in Washington, that there wouldn't be perhaps as much focus on things like uh, chlorinated chicken, which has been very much a contentious point between uh, the US and the UK. I think that the Conservative Party is also the party of the countryside. Uh, and one of the things from National Farmers Union has said is, you know, warned about chlorinated chicken, warned about standards in beef and the impact on um, of, you know, opening the borders to the U.S. produce, which would affect our ability to export to the EU. Um, Michael Gove so far has been very much on the side of British agriculture. So I don't I don't quite see how they could square the circle on this. I don't see how they could make that trade deal with the U.S. and not face consequences in terms of their heartlands. So I would say on balance, no. I'd, I'd say it's a vote loser for the Conservatives. For the Labour Party, actually, bizarrely, much easier. They don't have many votes in countryside seats. Um, they could do it. But, you know, in terms of animal rights, I think that's more the Labour Party's back, so they would also be against it. But they wouldn't lose uh, votes from it, whereas the Conservatives would lose votes and support if they did these things. Um, you mentioned uh, the Labour Party perhaps not being as uh, affected in regards to uh, if the UK would have to make concessions over things uh, like the chlorinated chicken. Um, how much of uh, a um, uphill battle do you think uh, Keir Starmer has in regaining uh, the Labour heartlands that switched from the Labour Party to the Conservatives at the last election? Um, I think that they, he, the, the, 
the tactics played by different parties played out in a particular way. The Brexit Party Limited is no longer existent in, I guess, in any way, except, um, you know, people still make payments to it every so often. Uh, they provided a route for people to vote for something other than the Conservative Party and not vote Labour. Now, as they don't exist anymore, the option is not available for some people who would never vote Conservative, and there's a real potential for, for Keir Starmer to bring those people back. However, the tactic has proved to be very successful, and so I couldn't rule it out happening again, but he may find it easier, and especially if Brexit happens or the end of transition period happens and we become a third country, that's a major kind of attack point that people won't have against Labour anymore. And it should therefore be much easier to bring back those people. Uh, we're coming towards the end of the uh, podcast. It's been great to have you on. It's been a very interesting uh, discussion. And um, I would like to ask you uh, one final question. Um, because of, obviously, and we've discussed it in the podcast, uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, a lot of things that people have in the past been able to do have been limited. Uh, so I wondered uh, what one thing that you can't do at the moment are you looking forward to being able to do again uh, once the situation is resolved? Uh, I think hugging my friends. Uh, I've really enjoyed speaking to a lot of friends uh, online and by telephone calls. Um, the social isolation, actually, you know, I'm with my family. Everything is fine in that respect. But hugging friends and family um, outside the household obviously hasn't happened. And, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to miss that. And I'm, there's a lot of people do a lot of hugs when this is all over. <laughs> I think that's a great answer. And I think uh, a lot of our listeners would agree, uh, would, you know, want to be able to, to hug their friends and hopefully will be able to uh, hug them uh, when this is all resolved. Thank you once again for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Um, if you've enjoyed this podcast, then you can subscribe to us on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube and Spreaker. Uh, you can email us at thedebatedpodcast at gmail.com, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Thank you once again for listening to the podcast. I hope you listen to the next one.